because we sold out uh, like two weeks ago. <laughs> so you all made the cut. Uh, it's a one night only show here in our speakeasy. Uh, and so Jill will tell you more about that. Our director, Jill Core, has worked really, really hard on this show as uh, have many of the cast members uh, that you know and love. So uh, just to tell you a little bit, we have, I don't know if you know, but we have a lot going on here uh, at the Arts Center. <laughs> Uh, a couple of things that I just wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, tomorrow night, we have Weta Michael, an intimate evening with Weta Michael, who is a uh, renowned, internationally renowned chef from right here in Central Kentucky. Uh, she's going to be uh, doing a talk and signing her cookbook, so you can meet her. It's only $20, and then we have a VIP reception for $40, and you'll actually get to be up close and personal with Weta. Uh, we'll also be doing a cooking demonstration on stage, and we're all a little nervous about that, uh, but I'm sure it's going to go well. It's going to be great. Um, and uh, then also on the back of your program, you'll see if you're a theater person, uh, in May and June, the end of May, beginning of June, we're doing The Laramie Project. That's our next big play, and that is based on the life of Matthew Shepard in Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, it's a very gut-wrenching, heart heartwarming story, um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful play, and we hope you will get tickets for that as well. Uh, we also have Finding Nemo this summer, um, and a few other shows in our theater season. So. Uh, this is really the kickoff to our 2024 theater season, so we're so glad that you're all here. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the brilliant Jill Core, our director. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. 
joining us tonight. As he said, my name is Jill Kaur. I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at the Gateway Regional Arts Center, as well as the director of the show you are about to see. Um, inside your program, there is a donation envelope if you are feeling especially generous this evening. Uh, that donation will help fund programs we put on here at GRAC. So the emergency exits are to your all's left. This back area here, as well as the stairs and the elevator that you came down. I don't think you're supposed to take an elevator in a fire. I think I learned that at school, so no <laughs> that. Um, there will be a 10 minute intermission. I'm sure some of you got an email from me saying there will not be an intermission. I lied. There will be a 10 minute <laughs> intermission where you're welcome to get more drinks from the bar and use the restroom. The restroom is in this back corner here um, where it says not an exit and there's a restroom sign. Um, so, please do not get up from your seats in the middle of the show. If you absolutely have to, please wait until applause. Um, so the actors you are about to see do this solely on a volunteer basis, giving their time and energy to bring you a great show. Uh, we have people who come from Maysville, Frankfurt, and beyond. So we're adopting a tradition from our good friends at Woodford Theater in Versailles. It's called the Standing Ovation Donation. So there is a container, a little basket over there on that countertop next to Monica, um, where you all can donate, and that money will be split amongst the cast members as a thanks for their hard work and the gas mileage that they're using. And I'm okay. going to challenge you to $10, everybody. <laughs> um, so our goal with this show is to take you back in time and immerse you into 1940s radio hour. We encourage you to get lost in the story. You can even close your eyes and just listen if you'd like to. Uh, so what did they not have in the 1940s? Does anyone know? Yeah. Cell phones! That's exactly right. They did not have cell phones. So please turn your phones off and put them away. There will be no pictures or video allowed. We already had professional pictures taken and tonight's performance is being recorded. So we have you covered on that end. Please do not get your cell phones out. Um, let's see. All right, that's my checklist there. So uh, without further ado, please sit back. Relax and then get ready to experience the Great Gatsby Alive radio play. brought with it new ways to make big money, speakeasies, bootleggers, and rum runners. And out of the 20s came Jay Gatsby, who built an empire out of a dream in his heart. One of the people who knew Gatsby best was the young man who lived next door to him. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mick Carraway. Criticizing anyone, just remember that all people in this world haven't had the same advantages that you have. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments as a matter of infinite hope. When I came back from the East Coast last autumn, I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gadsby was exempt from my reaction. Gadsby, who represented everything for which I have unaffected scorn. There was something gorgeous about it. The extraordinary gift he had for hope I have never found in any other person. 
Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby, what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. My family has been well-to-do for three generations. I graduated from Yale and then participated in the Great War. I decided to go east and learn the bond business. It was a matter of chance that I should have rented a house in one of the strangest communities in North America. Just off of Long Island, there are two enormous land formations that look like giant eggs that jut out and are separated by a bay. I lived in West Egg. My house was squeezed between two huge places that rented for 15,000 a season. The one on my right was a colossal affair with a tower and a marble swimming pool and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. It was Gatsby's mansion. The story of the summer began the evening I went across the bay to the more fashionable East Egg. I was invited to have dinner with the Buchanans, Daisy, my second cousin, and her husband Tom, whom I knew in college. He was one of those men who reached such excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. His family was enormously wealthy, and he'd left Chicago and come east in a fashion that rather took your breath away. When I arrived at their mansion, Tom rode up the huge lawn on one of his polo ponies. Nick! Hello, Tom. You've got a nice place here. It belonged to an oil tycoon. Let's go inside. A breeze blew through the room. There was an enormous couch on which sat Daisy and another young woman, both in white. <laughs> Nick, I'm paralyzed with happiness. Hello, Daisy. Everyone in Chicago sends their love. Do they miss me? The whole town is desolate. All the cars have the left rear wheel painted black as a morning wreath. How gorgeous. Let's go back, Tom, tomorrow. You ought to see the baby. She's two years old. Haven't you ever seen her? Never. What you doing, Nick? I'm a bond man with probity trust. Never heard of him. I'm stiff. I've been lying on this sofa for as long as I can remember. Don't look at me. I've been trying to get you to New York all afternoon. Nick, this is Jordan Baker. Have a drink, Jordan. No, thanks. I'm in training. You live in West Egg, Nick, so you must know Gatsby. Gatsby? Gatsby. Dinner is served. We were led out onto the porch, where four candles flickered on the table. <sighs> Why are candles? In two weeks will be the longest day in the year. Telephone for you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you. I excuse me. I'd love to see you at my table, Nick. You remind me of an absolute rose. Excuse me. This Mr. Gatsby you spoke of, Miss Lane. <sighs> Don't talk. I want to hear what happens. Is something happening? Uh, you mean to say you don't know? Tom's got some woman in New York. She might have the decency not to telephone him at dinner time. No, they're back. There's a bird on the lawn that I think must be a nightingale. He's singing away. Isn't it romantic, Tom? Very romantic. After dinner, I followed Daisy to the porch. We sat down on a wicker settee. We don't know each other very well, Nick, even if we are cousins. You didn't come to my wedding. I wasn't back from the war. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm pretty cynical about everything. Well, you have your daughter. I suppose she talks and eats and everything. Oh, yes. Listen, Nick, let me tell you what I said when she was less than an hour old and Tom was God knows where. I woke up with an utterly abandoned feeling and asked the nurse if it was a boy or a girl. She told me it was a girl. I said, I'm glad it's a girl, and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world, a beautiful little fool. I've been everywhere and seen everything. <laughs> God, I'm sophisticated. Daisy and I went back inside and joined Tom and Miss Baker. 10 o'clock. Time for this good girl to go to bed. Jordan's going to play the tournament tomorrow at Westchester. Oh, you're Jordan Baker, the golfer. That's right. Good night, Mr. Caraway. See you again. Oh, of course you will. In fact, I think I'll arrange a marriage. I'll fling you together, you know, lock you up accidentally in linen closets and push you out to sea in a boat. Good night. I haven't heard a word. <laughs> She's a nice girl. She's going to spend lots of weekends out here this summer, Nick. Is she from New York? From Louisville. Our girlhood was passed together there. At the end of the evening, I got up to go home. I forgot to ask you something, and it's important. We heard you were engaged to a girl out west. It's libel. I'm too poor. But we heard it from three people, so it must be true. I knew what they were referring to, but I wasn't even vaguely engaged and had no intentions of being rumored into marriage. When I got home, I saw a figure standing on Gatsby's lawn with his hands in his pockets. 
He stretched out his arms in a curious way toward the dark water, and a single green light that might have been the end of the dock. When I looked once more, he had vanished. Halfway between West Egg and Manhattan is a valley of ashes, a desolate industrial dumping ground. Above this gray land is a billboard prominently displaying the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eppelberg, blue and gigantic behind a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which some oculus set there to fatten his practice. These eyes seem to keep a watch on everything. Passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene too, for there is always a halt there of at least a minute. And that's how I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. I went up to New York on the train with Tom one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ash heaps, he jumped to his feet and literally forced me from the train. We're getting off. I want you to meet my girl. I followed Tom to a garage. Repairs, George B. Wilson, cars bought and sold. Hello, Wilson, old man. How's business? I can't complain. Uh, when are you going to sell me that car? Next week. I've got my man working on it now. Hello? Get some chairs, why don't you, so somebody can sit down? Okay, Myrtle. I want to see you, Myrtle. Get on the next train. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. All right. We left and waited for her at the station. Terrible place, isn't it? It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? He thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb, he doesn't know he's alive. So, Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York. Or, not quite together. As Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Pennsylvania Station, New York. Tom helped Mrs. Wilson to the platform. Upstairs, she let four taxi cabs drive away before she selected a new one. And in this, we drove up Fifth Avenue to an apartment building at 158th Street. I have to leave you all here. No, you don't. Myrtle will be hurt if you don't come up to the apartment. Won't you, Myrtle? Come on, Nick. I'll telephone my sister, Catherine. She said to be very beautiful by people who ought to know. The apartment was on the top floor. Mrs. Wilson's sister arrived, and we sat on a sofa too large for the room as Tom and Mrs. Wilson occupied the bedroom. <laughs> I was at a party on Long Island about a month ago with a man named Gatsby's. Do you know him? I live next door to him. Well, they say he's a cousin of Kaiser Wilhelm's. That's where all his money comes from. I'm scared of him. Neither Myrtle or Tom can stand the person they're married to. It's his wife that's keeping them apart. She doesn't believe in divorce. Who wants a drink? Yes, please. No, he, he didn't. It was on the train. I was going to New York to see Catherine and spend the night. I couldn't keep my eyes off of him, but every time he looked at me, I pretended to be looking at the advertisement over his head. When we came into the station, he was next to me in his white shirt front pressed against my arm. So I told him I'd have to call a policeman, but he knew I lied. I was so excited when we got into the taxi. All I kept thinking was, you can't live forever. You can't live forever. You can't. None of us can. Have another drink, Nick. I've been living over that garage for 11 years. I want you for myself, Tom, but no, there's Daisy. Don't say her name, Myrtle. Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. Ah! With a short, deft movement, Tom broke Myrtle's nose with his open hand. And there were bloody towels, and Myrtle wailing in pain. <laughs> I kept drinking. The next thing I knew, I was laying half asleep in the lower level of Pennsylvania Station, staring at the morning tribune and waiting for the train back home. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. Caterers would come with several hundred feet of canvas, buffet tables, and enough colored lights to make a Christmas tree of Gatsby's enormous garden. By seven o'clock, the orchestra had arrived. The bar is in full swing, and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden. The first night I went to Gatsby's house, I was one of the few guests who had actually been invited. A chauffeur crossed my lawn early that Saturday morning with a note from his employer. 
the honor would be entirely Gatsby's if I would attend his little party that night. I wandered around, rather ill at ease among swirls of people I didn't know. I slunk off in the direction of the cocktail table on my way to get roaring drunk when Jordan Baker came out of the house. Nick. I thought you might be here. I remember you live next door. <laughs> Do you come to these parties often? I like to come. When I was here last, I tore my gown on a chair, and he asked me my name and address. Inside of a week, I got a package with a new evening gown in it. It was blue with lavender beads. Two hundred and sixty-five dollars. There's something funny about a man who does things like that. He doesn't want trouble with anybody. Who doesn't? Gatsby. Somebody told me they thought he killed a man once. I don't think it's that so much. It's more that he was a German spy during the war. I heard a man who knew all about him. Grew up with him in Germany. And this is much too polite for me. Let's find the host. We walked into a Gothic library, paneled with carved English oak. A stout, middle-aged man with owl-eyed spectacles was sitting somewhat drunk on the edge of a great table. What do you think about all these books? They're absolutely real, pages and everything. Who brought you? I was brought by a woman named Roosevelt. I met her somewhere last night. I've been drunk for about a week now and I thought it might sober me up to sit in the library. <laughs> we went back outdoors. There was dancing in the garden. By midnight, the hilarity had increased. I was still with Jordan. We were sitting at a table with a man of about my age and at a lull in the entertainment, he looked at me and smiled. Your face is familiar. Weren't you in the 3rd Division during the war? Why, yes, I was in the 9th Machine Gun Battalion. I was in the 7th Infantry until June 1918. I knew I'd seen you somewhere before. It was on the tip of my tongue to ask his name when Jordan looked around and smiled. Having a gay time now? Much better. This is an unusual party for me. I haven't even seen the host. I live next door and this man Gatsby sent over his chauffeur with an invitation. I'm Gatsby. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you knew old sport. I'm afraid I'm not a very good host. He smiled. One of those rare smiles that you may come across only a few times in life. Chicago wants you on the phone, sir. All right. Tell them I'll be right there. If you want anything, just ask for it, old sport. Excuse me. I'll rejoin you later. Who is he? He's just a man named Gatsby. Where is he from? What does he do? Well, he told me once he was an Oxford man, but I don't think he went there. Anyhow, he gives large parties, and I like large parties. They're so intimate. A small party. <laughs> there isn't any privacy. Miss Baker, I beg your pardon, but Mr. Gatsby would like to speak with you alone. She followed the butler toward the house. I waited in the hall, and a few minutes later, the door of the library opened, and Jordan and Gatsby came out together. Several people approached him to say goodbye. I just heard the most amazing thing, but I swore I wouldn't tell it, and here I am tantalizing you. She hurried off, and I joined Gatsby. I apologize for not having known him in the garden. Don't mention it. Don't give it another thought. Philadelphia wants you on the phone, sir. All right. In a minute. Good night, old sport. Good night. One morning late in July, Gatsby's gorgeous car lurched up the rocky drive to my door. Good morning, old sport. You're having lunch with me today, and I thought we'd ride up to New York together. It's a pretty car, isn't it? I'd seen it. Everybody had seen it. It was a rich yellow, swollen in its monstrous length and terraced with a labyrinth of windshields that mirrored a dozen suns. Sitting down in a sort of green leather conservatory, we started to town. Look here, old sport. I'm going to tell you something about my life. I don't want you to get a wrong idea from all the stories you hear. I'm the son of some wealthy people in the Midwest. I was brought up in America, but educated at Oxford because it's a family tradition. What part of the Middle West? San Francisco. Oh, I see. <laughs> my family all died, and I came into a good deal of money. After that, I lived like a young Raja in all the capitals of Europe, collecting jewels, hunting big game, painting a little, and trying to forget something very sad that had happened to me. Then came the war, and I accepted a commission as first lieutenant. 
I was promoted to major, and every Allied government gave me a decoration. Even Montenegro, down the Adriatic Sea. He reached into his pocket, and a medal on a ribbon fell into my palm. <coughs> to my astonishment, the thing had an authentic look. Major J. Gatsby, for valor extraordinary. Here's a souvenir of my Oxford days. It was a photograph of half a dozen young men in blazers, and there was Gatsby, looking a little younger with a cricket bat in his hand. Then it was all true. I'm going to make a big request of you. You'll hear about it this afternoon. At lunch? No, later. I happened to find out that you were taking Miss Baker to tea. She has kindly consented to speak to you about this matter. I hadn't the faintest idea what this matter was. We passed through the Valley of Ashes, and I had a glimpse of Myrtle Wilson at the garage pump. Then I heard the jolt, jolt, smack of a motorcycle, and a policeman rode alongside. <laughs> Taking a white card from his wallet, Gatsby waved it before the policeman's eyes. Right you are. No, you next time, Mr. Gatsby. What was Excuse that? Excuse me. What was that, the picture of Oxford? I was able to do the commissioner a favor once. He sends me a Christmas card every year. In a well fanned 42nd Street cellar, I met Gatsby and his friend for lunch. Mr. Carraway? This is my friend, Mr. Wolfsheim. Hello, there. Uh, this is a nice restaurant, but I like the one across the street. It's yes. too hot over there. Hot and small, yes, but full of memories. What place is that? Uh, it's the old Metropole. I can't forget as long as I live the night they shot Rosie Rosenthal. Oh, Rosie had eaten and drunk a lot all evening. When it was almost morning, the waiter came to him and says somebody wants to speak to him outside. All right, says Rosie, and begins to get up, and I pulled him down in his chair and said, let the bastards come in here if they want to, Rosie. Did he go? Sure. He went out on the sidewalk, and they shot him three times and drove away. Well, I understand you're looking for a business connection. Oh, no. This is just a friend. I told you we'd talk about that some other time. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, I had the wrong man. Oh, excuse me. Oh, he has to telephone somebody. A fine fellow, isn't he? Handsome and a perfect gentleman. <coughs> and he's an Oxford man. Have you known Gatsby for a long time? Oh, several years. I made the pleasure of his acquaintance just after the war. I see you're looking at uh, my cliff buttons, huh? Oh, my cups. Oh, they're the finest specimen of human molars. Well, <laughs> that's a very interesting idea. When Gatsby returned to the table and sat down, Mr. Wolfsheim drank his coffee and got to his feet. Oh, yes. I have enjoyed my lunch, and I'm going to run off from you two young men before I outstay my welcome. Don't hurry, Meyer. Oh, you're very polite, but I, but I belong to another generation. Uh, you sit here and discuss your sports and, and your young ladies. <laughs> He's quite a character around New York. A dentist at a Broadway. Who is he, an actor? Oh, no. A dentist? <laughs> no. Meyer Wolfshine is a gambler. He's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. <laughs> fixed the World Series? Why isn't he in jail? They can't get him on sport. He's a smart man. I caught sight of Tom Buchanan headed in our direction. Nick, where have you been? Daisy's furious because you haven't called up. Uh, this is Mr. Gatsby, Mr. Buchanan. How do you do, old sport? Fine. Uh, nice to meet you. How'd you happen to come up this far to eat? I've been having lunch with Mr. Gatsby. I turned toward Gatsby, but he was no longer there. That afternoon, I met Jordan in the tea garden at the Plaza Hotel, and she told me Gatsby's story. One October day of 1917, I was walking in the neighborhood. The largest of lawns belonged to Daisy Faye's house. She was 18 and the most popular girl in Louisville. All day long, her telephone rang and excited young officers demanded the privilege of monopolizing her that night. When I came to her house that morning, she was sitting in her white roadster with a lieutenant I had never seen before. They were so engrossed with each other, she didn't see me at first. Hello, Jordan. Are you going to the Red Cross to make bandages? I am. 
Would you tell them I can't come today? The officer looked at Daisy in a way that every young girl wants to be looked at. His name was Jay Gatsby. By the next year, I had a few bow myself, and I began to play in golf tournaments, so I didn't see Daisy very often. Wild rumors were circulating about her, how her mother had found her packing her bag one night to go to New York to say goodbye to a soldier who was going overseas. She was prevented, but after that, she didn't play around with the soldiers anymore. The following June, she married Tom Buchanan with more pomp and circumstance than Wolfel had ever knew before. He hired a whole floor of the Sealbach Hotel, and the day before the wedding, he gave her a string of pearls valued at $350,000. I was a bridesmaid, and half an hour before the bridal dinner, I found her lying on her bed as drunk as a monkey. <laughs> she had a bottle of Sauternes in one hand and a letter in the other. Congratulate me. Never had a drink before, but oh, how I do enjoy it. I was scared. I'd never seen her like that before. I asked what I could do. Here, dearest, take these pearls and give them back to whoever they belong to. Tell it old Daisy's changed her mind. She cried and cried. I rushed out and found her mother's maid, and we got her into a cold bath. She wouldn't let go of the letter and squeezed it up into a wet ball. We put ice on her forehead and hooked her back into her dress, and half an hour later, the pearls were around her neck, and the incident was over. The next day, she married Tom Buchanan and started off on a three-month trip to the South Seas. I saw them when they came back, and I thought I'd never seen a girl so mad about her husband. If he left the room for even a minute, she'd look around uneasily and say, Where's Tom gone? The next April, Daisy had her little girl, and they came back to Chicago to settle down. They moved with a fast crowd, all of them young and rich and wild. Well, about six weeks ago, she heard the name Gatsby for the first time in years. It wasn't until then that I connected this Gatsby with the officer in her white car. It was a strange coincidence. But it wasn't a coincidence at all. Gatsby bought that house so that Daisy would be just across the bay. He wants to know if you'll invite Daisy to your house some afternoon and then let him come over. Did I have to know all this before he could ask such a little thing? He thought you might be offended. He wants her to see his house. And your house is right next door. Oh, uh, does Daisy want to see Gatsby? Gatsby doesn't want her to know. You're just supposed to invite her to tea. When I came home, Gatsby's house was lit from tower to cellar, but there wasn't a sound. I saw Gatsby walking toward me across his lawn. Your place looks like the World's Fair. Does it? I talked with Jordan. I'm gonna call up Daisy tomorrow and invite her over here to tea. Oh, that's all right. I don't want to put you to any trouble. How about the day after tomorrow? I want to get the grass cut. I called up Daisy and invited her to come to tea. Don't bring Tom. What? Don't bring Tom. Who is Tom? <laughs> Turn to the WBFR Playhouse of the Air presentation of The Great Gatsby after a word from our sponsor, TJ Ethelbert Fashion Design Spectacle Frames. Hey there, Sally. Why the long face? Oh, Lana, I just visited my optometrist and found out I need glasses. Why, what's wrong with that? Well, you know what they say. Men seldom make passes at girls who wear glasses. <laughs> well, let me turn that frown upside down and assure you that old adage is simply no longer the case. Not when you're wearing T.J. Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames, that is. T.J. Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames? That's right, Sally. With T.J. Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames, no longer are girls who wear glasses doomed to look owlish, bookish, or just plain dull. Flattering T.J. Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames make you look lovelier than you ever thought possible, and they give your spirits a lift. But fancy wearing the same spectacle frames with all your pretty dresses. Why, that would be like wearing the same hat every day. Unthinkable! <laughs> Dress up your eyes with exciting frames that were created for cocktails, meant for the theater, and patterned to parade yourself in. These days, the fashion accent is on eyes. Your spectacles become the most important part of your personality. And T.J. Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames see that your eyes have it. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> when you need four eyes instead of two, don't let that get you down. For this parade of fashion frames will let you go to town. With styles galore, and lots of allure, TJ Eckelberg Fashion Designs, Spectacle Brains. No other specs will make heads turn in every single season. When you're walking down the aisle, this will be the reason. With styles galore, and lots of allure, TJ Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames. It's little wonder that renowned oculist and spectacle frame designer TJ Eckelberg exports his creations to the fashion capitals of the world. After all, they are the smartest, best crafted spectacle frames made anywhere, designed to bring out the best of your looks and put a sparkle in your eyes. With styles galore, and lots of allure, TJ Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames. Personally fitted by your optometrist or optical dispenser today. <laughs> you to act two of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby after a 10 minute intermission. <laughs>
and then he said he said he had to get in trouble, but he did. I said, he said your name loud, yes, but you have to think it. That was just you didn't think through. You didn't think it through before you did it. But like he acted like I had taken taken any. Uh, I got I got taken all of his uh, toys and amenities or whatever. I was like, I was like, you know, I like, I like, was like, you were yelling and screaming. No, I said your name. That's all I said loud. And then I took a breath. And then I told you why I was upset. I felt kind of like I had to do that. So that's where we're at. I think we got mad at me. Yeah. 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 Oh, the night before, the night before last, like, the boys started fighting, and it was five minutes to seven. They lay down at seven. They started fighting with each other. That's all right, boys. Let's go ahead. All right, boys. Let's go ahead and get everybody to come and test it. Elijah. No. Um, Elijah. Uh, I did not ask him to go to the bathroom. But Elijah said, But Elijah said, No, until we know he wasn't getting to the bathroom. I said, No, I didn't ask a question. Let's go ahead and y'all start the fight. Make sure you're tired. I'm going to go to the TV, but go to the bathroom. No. Well, I don't want to take the TV out of here. You don't do the rest of the world. They are glad to meet the rest of the night. Because I said, I'm going to get out of here. It's okay. So that's where we're at now. I can't even. I raised my voice. And just said, I like this night in here. I said, I'm going to get out of here. They're, they're already used to me like, being a calm and gentle with their own parents. I can't even tell them no. Not that I told them no a ton before. Oh, I came home from work. I was sitting there last week. And as soon as I walked in the door, Elijah handed me a piece of paper and laminated it. And on one side said, I love you and we have a third. Said, well, I'll go fast. You haven't yelled at us in like 30 days. <laughs> and then I was like, okay. And I turned it over. And uh, the other side said, thank you. I love you a lot. I was like, what's this for? Because he's like, you know what it's for. <laughs> Maybe you know what it's for. They didn't understand what it was. I mean, they know. Elijah told me the other day, he said, I explained to him, we don't need to tell everybody, but they actually have a daddy and they can change the world. You know how you all are down and down and get 40 years? And I said, yeah, that is not a good idea. A couple days, like a year, we got to go fast. Can I tell you something? He said, it's about to change. We were like, I don't know where we were. We were in touch with him. He was like, make you quit shooting. No, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> no. Looks like, I know it didn't make me down here that night. They had to be great. I was the point in the evening where I was going to sleep in time too. I'm going to wind down the floor. I didn't think 
greenhouse arrived from Gatsby's. An hour later, Gatsby hurried in. The journal said the rain would stop about four. Have you gotten everything you need for tea? Together, we scrutinized the 12 lemon cakes. Will they do? Of course, of course, they're fine, old sport. The rain cooled about half past three to a damp mist. Gatsby peered toward the windows from time to time. I'm going home. She's not coming. I can't wait all day. Don't be silly, it's just two minutes to four. He sat down, and simultaneously there was the sound of a motor turning into my lane. We both jumped up, and I went out into the yard. Is this where you live, my dearest one? Are you in love with me, or why did I have to come along? That's the secret. Tell your chauffeur to go away and spend an hour. Come back in an hour, Ferdy. We went in. <laughs> to my surprise, the living room was deserted. Well, that's funny. That's funny. Excuse me. I went to open the door. Gatsby was standing in a puddle of water, glaring tragically into my eyes. He stalked by me into the hall and disappeared into the living room. For half a minute, there wasn't a sound aside from the rain. Then from the living room, I heard a sort of choking murmur. I joined them. Uh, I certainly am awfully glad to see you again. It's been a long time. Five years next November. Excuse me. Where are you going? I'll be back. I've got to speak to you about something before you go. He followed me into the kitchen. Oh, God. This is a terrible idea. You're just embarrassed, that's all. Daisy's embarrassed, too. She's embarrassed. Just as much as you are. Don't talk so loud. You're acting like a little boy. <laughs> Not only that, but you're rude. Daisy is sitting in there, all alone. He went back into the other room. I walked out the back way and ran for a huge tree whose leaves made a fabric against the rain. After half an hour, the sun came out, so I went inside. They were there, sitting on the couch, looking at each other, and every vestige of embarrassment was gone. Daisy's face was smeared with tears. Oh, hello, old sport. It stopped raining. What do you think of that, Daisy? It stopped raining. I'm glad, Jay. I want you and Daisy to come over to my house. I'd like to show her around. You're sure you want me to come? Absolutely, old sport. Daisy went upstairs to wash her face while Gatsby and I waited on the lawn. My house looks well, doesn't it? It's splendid. It took me three years to earn the money and bought it. I thought you inherited your money. I did, old sport, but I lost most of it in the panic of the war. What business are you in? Oh, I've been in several things. I was in the drugstore business, in the oil business, but I'm not in either one now. Daisy came out of the house. That huge place there? Do you like it? I love it, but I don't see how you live there all alone. I keep it full of interesting people, night and day. We entered by the huge door and wandered through music rooms and salons. We went upstairs through dozens of bedrooms, intruding into one where a disheveled man in pajamas was doing exercises. 
Finally, we came into Gatsby's own bedroom, which was the simplest room of all. Except where the dresser was garnished with a toilet set of pure gold. Daisy took the brush with delight and smoothed her hair. Gatsby sat down and began to laugh. <laughs> he was consumed with wonder by her presence. Recovering himself, he opened two enormous cabinets, which held his suits, ties, and shirts, piled in stacks a dozen high. I've got a man in England who buys me clothes. He sends over a selection of things at the beginning of each season. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them on the bed. Shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel. Here are shirts with stripes and scrolls, plaids and coral and apple green and lavender, orange and Indian blue. I've never seen such beautiful shirts before. After the house, we saw the grounds and the swimming pool, but it began to rain again, so we stood looking at Long Island Sound. If it wasn't for the mist, we could see your home across the bay. You have a green light that burns at night at the end of your dock. Daisy put her arm through his, but he seemed absorbed in what he had just said. Possibly it had occurred to him that the colossal significance of that light had now vanished forever. It was, again, just a green light on a dock. I began to walk about the room, then looked at the photograph of a man in yachting costume. Who's this? That's Mr. Dan Cody, old sport. He's dead now, but uh, he used to be my best friend years ago. There was a small picture of Gatsby, also in yachting costume, taken when he was about 18. I adore it, the pompadour! You never told me you had a pompadour or a yacht. Look at this. There are your clippings about you. Yes? Well, I can't talk now. I said a small town. He's no use to us if Detroit is his idea of a small town. I know what we'll do. We'll have Cliff Springer play the piano. He went out of the room and returned in a few minutes, accompanied by Cliff Springer. Did we interrupt your exercises? I fell asleep. Cliff Springer plays the piano. Don't you, old sport? I don't play well. I'm all out of practice, you see. Don't, don't talk so much. Play. Cliff Springer went to the piano in the salon and began to play and sing along. Every morning, every evening, ain't we got fun? Not much money, oh, but honey, ain't we got fun? All the lights were going on in West Egg now. As I said goodbye, I saw that the expression of bewilderment had come back into Gatsby's face. Almost five years. There must have been moments that afternoon when Daisy tumbled just short of his dreams. No amount of fire or freshness can begin to challenge what a man will store up in his heart. His hand took hold of hers, and they looked back at me. There was nothing I could do, so I left them there, together. There's nothing sure of the rich get rich and the poor get children. In the meantime, in between time, ain't we got fun? all summer, but gradually I learned the truth about James Gats. That was really legally his name. He had changed it at the age of 17 when he saw Dan Cody's yacht drop anchor on Lake Superior. It was James Gats who had been loafing along the beach, but it was Jay Gatsby who borrowed a rowboat and informed Cody that a wind might catch him and break him up. I suppose he'd had the name ready for a long time. His parents were unsuccessful farm people. His imagination had never accepted them as his parents. So he invented just the sort of Jay Gatsby that a 17-year-old boy would invent. Dan Cody was 50 years old, many times a millionaire. To the young Gats, the yacht represented all the beauty in the world. Cody found that he was quick and ambitious, and when the boat left for the West Indies, Gatsby was on it. He was employed in a vague personal capacity, steward, mate, skipper, secretary. 
The arrangement lasted five years and might have lasted indefinitely, except that Dan Cody died. Gatsby told me all this much later, at a time when I had reached the point of believing everything and nothing about him. One Saturday night, Tom, Daisy, and I went to Gatsby's party. There were the same people, the same confusion of champagne, but now I was looking at it through Daisy's eyes. These things excite me so. Look around. You must see the faces of many people you've heard about. We don't go around very much. In fact, I don't know a soul here. Perhaps you know that lady. She's in the movies. She's lovely. Daisy and Gatsby danced. Then they sauntered over to my house and sat on the steps for half an hour, while at her request I remained watchfully in the garden. After supper, during which Tom ate at another table with a common but pretty girl, as Daisy characterized her, I sat on the front steps with Daisy and Tom while they waited for their car. Who is this Gatsby, anyhow? Some bootlegger? A lot of these newly rich people are just bootleggers, you know. Not Gatsby. Well, he certainly must have strained himself to get this menagerie together. At least they're more interesting than the people we know. I'd like to know who he is and what he does. And I think I'll make a point of finding out. I can tell you right now, he owned a lot of drugstores. He built them up himself. Good night, Nick. I stayed late that night. Gatsby asked me to wait until he was free. She didn't have a good time. I feel far away from her. It's hard to make her understand. He wanted nothing less of Daisy than for her to tell Tom, I never loved you, obliterating the past three years. Then she and Gatsby would go back to Louisville and be married, just as if it were five years ago. She used to understand. We'd sit for hours. You can't repeat the past. Can't repeat the past? Why, of course you can. It was when curiosity about Gatsby was at its highest, when the light in his house failed to go on one Saturday night. The next day, Gatsby called me on the phone. Have you been sick? Are you going away? No, old sport. I hear you fired all your servants. Uh, Daisy comes over quite often in the afternoons, and I didn't want the gossip. I see. He was calling me at Daisy's request. Would I come to lunch at her house tomorrow? Jordan would be there. Something was up. <coughs> the next day was broiling, the warmest of the summer. Daisy and Jordan lay upon the enormous couch. Gatsby stood in the center of the crimson carpet. Daisy watched him and laughed her sweet, exciting laugh. <laughs> That's Tom's girl on the telephone. <laughs> Very well, then. I won't sell you the car. I'm under no obligations to you. And as for bothering me about it at lunchtime, I won't stand that at all. Holding down the receiver? No, he's not. It's a bona fide deal. I happen to know about it. Mr. Gatsby, I'm glad to see you. Nick? Make us a cold drink, Tom. Coming up. As he left the room again, Daisy went over to Gatsby and pulled his face down, kissing him on the mouth. You know I love you. You forget there's a lady present. You kiss Nick, too. What a low, vulgar girl. I don't care. Tom came back with four gin rickies that clipped full of ice. What do we do with ourselves this afternoon, and the day after that, and the next 30 years? Don't be morbid. Life starts all over again when it gets crisp in the fall. But it's so hot. Let's all go to town. Who wants to go? Jay? All right. I'm perfectly willing to go to town. Come on, let's start. Daisy and Jordan went upstairs to get ready, while we three men stood outside shuffling the hot pebbles with our feet. I don't see the idea of going to town. Women get these notions in their heads. Shall we take anything to drink? I'll get some whiskey. Excuse me, gents. I can't say anything in his household, Spool. She's got an indiscreet voice. It, it's full of... Her voice is full of money. It was full of money. The simple song of it. Tom came out of the house wrapping a bottle and a towel, followed by Daisy and Jordan. Shall we all go in my car? Well, you take my coupe and let me drive your car to town. I don't think there's much gas. Plenty of gas. Come on, Daisy, I'll take you in this circus wagon. No, you take Nick and Jordan. We'll follow you in the coop. Jordan and Tom and I got into the front seat of Gatsby's car. Did you see that? Uh, you think I'm pretty dumb, don't you? Perhaps I am, but I've made a small investigation of his past. And you found he was an Oxford man. An Oxford man? Like hell he is. 
Oxford, New Mexico, or something like that. Listen, Tom, if you're such a snob, why did you invite him to lunch? Daisy invited him. She knew it before we were married. God knows where. We drove for a while in silence. Then, as Dr. T.J. Eckelberg's eyes came into sight, I remembered Gadsby's caution about gasoline. We've got enough gas to get us into town. But there's a garage right here. I don't want to get stalled in this baking heat. Let's have some gas, Wilson. What do you think we stopped for? To admire the view? I'm sick. I've been sick all day. You sounded well enough on the phone. Well, I needed money pretty bad. And I was wondering what you were going to do with your old car. Uh, how'd you like this one? I bought it last week. It's a nice yellow one. Like to buy it? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I could make some money on the other. What do you want money for all of a sudden? Well, my wife and I want to go west. Your wife does? She's been talking about it for years, and now she's going to, whether she wants to or not. I just wised up to something funny the last two days. That's why I want to get away. I realized Wilson had discovered that Myrtle had some sort of life apart from him. But his suspicions hadn't alighted on Tom. I'll let you have the car. I'll send it over tomorrow afternoon. As we drove away, Tom was feeling the hot whips of panic. His wife and his mistress, until an hour ago secure, were slipping from his control. Instinct made him step on the accelerator, and we sped along until we came sight of the blue coupe. Daisy signaled us to draw up alongside. Where are we going? How about the movies? It's so hot. You go. We'll ride around and meet you. We can't argue about it here. Follow me to the plaza. We engaged a suite at the Plaza Hotel. It was large and stifling. Open another window. There aren't any more. The thing to do is to forget about the heat. You make it ten times worse by crabbing about it. Why not let her alone, old sport? You're the one that wanted to come to town. That's a great expression of yours, isn't it? All this old sport business. Where'd you pick that up? I understand you're an Oxford man. Yes, I went there. I'd like to know when. I only stayed five months. That's why I can't really call myself an Oxford man. It was an opportunity they gave to some of the officers after the armistice. Open the whiskey, Tom, and I'll make you a mint julep. Then you won't seem so stupid to yourself. Wait a minute. <laughs> I want to ask Mr. Gatsby one more question. Go on. What kind of a row are you trying to cause in my house anyhow? Chuck isn't causing a row, Tom. You're causing a row. Please have a little self-control. Self-control? I suppose the latest thing is to sit back and let Mr. Nobody from Nowhere make love to your wife. I've got something to tell you, old boy. Please don't, Jay. Let's all go home. That's a good idea. Come on, Tom. I want to know what Mr. Gatsby has to tell me. Your wife doesn't love you. She never loved you. She loves me. You must be crazy. You never, she never loved you. Do you hear? She only married you because I was poor and she was tired of waiting for me. It was a terrible mistake. But in her heart, she never loved anyone except me. What's been going on? I want to hear all about it. It's been going on for five years. You've been seeing this fellow for five years, Daisy? No, not seeing. We couldn't meet. But both of us loved each other all that time. I used to laugh sometimes to think that you didn't know. You're crazy. I can't speak about what happened five years ago because I didn't know Daisy then. But all the rest of that's a goddamn lie. Daisy loved me when she married me, and she loves me now. No. She does, though. The trouble is, sometimes she gets foolish ideas in her head. And once in a while, I go off on a spree and make a fool of myself. But I always come back. And in my heart, I love her all the time. You're revolting! Just tell him the truth, Daisy, that you never loved him. And it's all wiped out forever. Why, how could I love him possibly? You never loved him. I never loved him. Not when we were in Hawaii? No. Not that day I carried you down from the punch bowl to keep your shoes dry? Please don't. There, Jay. Oh, you want too much. I love you now. Isn't that enough? I can't help what's past. I did love him once, but I loved you too. You loved me too? Even that's a lie. She didn't know you were alive. Why, there are things between Daisy and me that you'll never know. Things that neither of us can ever forget. 
I want to speak to Daisy alone. Even alone, I can't say I never loved Tom. It wouldn't be true. Of course it wouldn't. As if it mattered to you. Of course it matters. I'm going to take better care of you from now on. You don't understand. You're not going to take care of her anymore. I'm not. Daisy's Why leaving Why is that? She's leaving you. Nonsense. I am, though. She's not leaving me. Certainly not for a common swindler who'd have to steal the ring he put on her finger. I won't stand this. Oh, please, let's get out. Who are you, anyhow? You're one of that bunch that hangs around with Meyer Wolfsheim. That much I happen to know. I've made a little investigation into your affairs. I found out what your drugstores were. He and this Wolfsheim bought up a lot of side street drugstores here and in Chicago and sold grain alcohol over the counter. I picked him for a bootlegger the first time I saw him, and I wasn't far wrong. What about it, old sport? Don't you call me old sport. That drugstore business was just small change. But you've got something bigger on now that people are afraid to talk about. Please, Tom, I can't stand this anymore. You two start on home, Daisy. In Mr. Gatsby's car. He won't annoy you. I think he realizes that his presumptuous little flirtation is over. And they were gone without a word. After a moment, Tom got up and began wrapping the unopened bottle of whiskey in the towel. Want any of this stuff? Jordan? Nick? No, I just remember that today's my birthday. I was 30. Before me stretched the menacing road of a new decade. WBFR Playhouse of the Air presentation of The Great Gatsby after a word from our sponsor, the Greenlight Automobile Service Company. Having car trouble, Lana? I'll say I am. And of all times, I'm late for a hot date and don't know an undercarriage from a tailpipe. <laughs> well, 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 that is a pickle. Can you keep a secret? No. I don't know an undercarriage from a tailpipe either. But your car is always in tip-top shape and never lets you down. That's my little secret. You see, I have a friend. Oh? Do tell. What's his name? But my handy-dandy green light, I'm going to be service repair man. That's who. Swell! Say, you've got all the brakes. My handy-dandy green light, I'm going to be service repair man, has all the brakes, spark plugs, and hubcaps, too. Anytime I'm having car trouble, I simply call him and my troubles vanish into the ether. Do you suppose your handy-dandy green light automobile service repairman could give me a hand? He'd be happy to. And with over a hundred locations across the continental United States, there's never a green light automobile service company far from your home. On the road of life, few things are sure. It's quite the uphill ride. When you hit a bump and can't endure, green light is on your side. Red light, your windshield cracks. Red light, you're stuck in the snow. Red light, wild light the tax. Green light, you're good to go. Red light, teams rattles and shakes. Red light, your tires blow. Red light, someone cut your brakes. Green light, green light, green light, you're good to go. Look for the green light automobile service company in your classified phone book today. Your car will thank you. We return you now to the conclusion of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. It was seven o'clock when Jordan and I got into the coupe with Tom and started for Long Island. We drove on toward death through the cooling twilight. Michaelis, the young Greek who ran the coffee joint besides the ash heaps, was the principal witness at the inquest. He strolled over to the garage and found George Wilson, sick in his office, pale and shaking all over. Michaelis advised him to go to bed, but a violent racket broke out overhead. I had got my wife locked up in there. She's going to stay there till the day after tomorrow, and then we're going to move away. Michaelis tried to find out what had happened, but Wilson wouldn't say a word. Instead, he began to ask him what he'd been doing at certain times on certain days. 
Just as Michaelis was getting uneasy, some workmen came past the door bound for his restaurant. He took the opportunity to get away. When he went outside again later, he heard Mrs. Wilson's voice in the garage. A moment later, she rushed out into the dusk, waving her hands and shouting. And before McKellis could move, it was over. The death car, as the newspapers called it, didn't stop. Came out of nowhere, wavered for a moment, and then disappeared around the bend. A car going toward New York stopped a hundred yards beyond. McKellis and the driver reached Myrtle first, but it was too late. We saw three or four automobiles in a crowd, and we were still some distance away. A wreck. That's good. Wilson will have a little business at last. We'll just take a look. There's some bad trouble here. Tom pushed his way through the crowd and into the garage. Myrtle Wilson's body was wrapped in a blanket on a work table. A motorcycle policeman was taking down names in a little book. Wilson was swaying back and forth. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Listen to me. What's up, fellow? What happened? That's what I want to know. An auto hit her. Instantly killed her. She ran out in the road. Son of a bitch didn't even stop his car. I saw the, I saw the car. It was a big new yellow car. Passed me down the road, going 50, 60 miles an hour. Let's have your name. Listen, Wilson, you've got to pull yourself together. That yellow car I was driving this afternoon wasn't mine, do you hear? What's all that? I'm a friend of his. He says he knows the car that did it. It was a yellow car. And what color's your car? It's a blue coupe. Let's get out of here, Nick. Tom drove slowly until we were beyond the bend. And we raced along through the night. The goddamn coward. He didn't even stop his car. The Buchanan's house appeared suddenly through the trees. Daisy's home. I ought to have dropped you in West Egg, Nick. I'll telephone for a taxi to take you home. Won't you come in, Nick? No thanks, Jordan. I'll wait outside for my taxi. I'd be damned if I'd go in. I had enough of all of them. I walked down the drive and saw Gatsby. Nick, what are you doing? Just standing here, old sport. Did you see any trouble on the road? Yes. Was she killed? Yes. I told Daisy I thought so. She stood it pretty well. I got to West Egg by side road and left the car in my garage. Uh, I don't think anybody saw us. I didn't bother to tell him he was wrong. Who was the woman? Her name was Myrtle Wilson. Her husband owns the garage. How the devil did it happen? Well, I, I tried to swing. Was Daisy real. driving? Yes, of, but of course I'll say I was. You see, when we left New York, she was very nervous, and she thought it would steady her to drive, and this woman rushed out at us. It all happened in a minute, but it seemed to me that she wanted to speak to us. Thought we were somebody she knew. The second my hand reached the wheel, I felt the shock. It must have killed her instantly. It ripped her open. Don't tell me, old sport. Anyhow, I tried to make Daisy stop, but she couldn't. So I pulled on the emergency brake and then she fell over into my lap. I, I drove on. She'll be all right tomorrow. She's locked herself into her room. And if he tries any brutality, she's going to turn the light out and on again. He won't touch her. He's not thinking about her. I don't trust him. How long are you going to wait? All night, if necessary. I walked to the window. Daisy and Tom were sitting at the kitchen table. He was talking intently, and once in a while she looked up at him and nodded. They weren't happy, and yet they weren't unhappy either. Is it all quiet up there? Yes. You'd better come home and get some sleep. I want to wait here till Daisy goes to bed. Good night, old sport. I left him standing there in the moonlight, watching over nothing. I couldn't sleep, half sick between grotesque reality and savage dreams. Toward dawn, I heard a taxi go up Gatsby's Drive, and I jumped out of bed. I had to warn him. Nothing happened. About four o'clock, she came to the window and stood there for a minute and then turned out the light. It's pretty certain they'll trace your car. You ought to go to Atlantic City for a week or up to Montreal. I couldn't consider it. How could I possibly leave Daisy until I know what she's going to do? He was clutching at some last hope. And I, I couldn't bear to shake him free. 
<clears throat> he wanted to talk about Daisy. She was the first nice girl he had ever known. It excited him, too, that many men had already loved Daisy. It increased her value to him. But he knew that however glorious his future as Jay Gatsby might be, he was at the present a penniless young man without a past. And at any moment, the invisible cloak of his uniform might slip from his shoulders. I can't describe how surprised I was to find out I loved her old sport. I even hoped that she would throw me over, but she didn't, because she was in love with me too. <clears throat> the last afternoon before I went abroad, I sat with Daisy in my arms for a very long time. We'd never been closer. I did well in the war, and after the armistice, I, I tried to get home, but I ended up at Oxford instead. I was worried. There was despair in Daisy's letters. She wanted to see me, but be reassured that she was doing the right thing by waiting for me. She wanted her life shaped immediately, and a decision made by some force of love, of money that was close at hand. <clears throat> that force took shape with the arrival of Tom Buchanan. There was something about his person and position. Daisy was flattered. Her letter reached me while I was still at Oxford. I don't think she ever loved him, old sport. Of course, she might have loved him when they were first married, and yet still loved me more even then. You see? It was nine o'clock when we finished breakfast and went out on the porch. The gardener came to the foot of the steps. I'm going to drain the pool today, Mr. Gatsby. Leaves will start falling pretty soon, and then there's always trouble with the pipes. Don't do it today. You know, old sport, I've never used that pool all summer. Twelve minutes to my train. I didn't want to go to the city. I wasn't worth a decent stroke of work, but more than that, I didn't want to leave Gatsby. I'll call you about noon. Do, old sport. I suppose Daisy will call too? I suppose so. Well, <clears throat> goodbye, old sport. They're a rotten crowd. You're worth a whole damn bunch put together. He nodded politely, and then his face broke out into a fat, radiant smile. Now, I want to go back a little and tell what happened at the garage after we left the night before. Until long after midnight, a changing crowd hung around the garage while George Wilson rocked himself back and forth on the couch inside. Michaela sat with him. About three o'clock, the quality of Wilson's incoherent muttering changed. He grew quieter and began to obsess over the yellow car. He announced that he had a way of finding out whom it belonged to. And then he blurted out that a couple of months ago his wife had come home from the city with her face bruised and her nose swollen. He murdered her. It was an accident, George. It was the man in that car. She ran out to speak to him and he wouldn't stop. Maybe you got some friend that could telephone for you, George? Oh, I took her to the window and I said, God knows everything you've been doing. You may fool me, but you can't fool God. God knows everything. Those are just eyes on an advertisement, George. Michaelis was worn out and went home to sleep. When he awoke and hurried back to the garage, Wilson was gone. There were boys who had seen a man acting sort of crazy. He went from garage to garage inquiring about a yellow car and finally learned Gatsby's name and where he lived. At two o'clock, Gatsby put on his bathing suit and told the butler that if anyone phoned, word was to be brought to him at the pool. No telephone message arrived. I have an idea that Gatsby himself didn't believe it would come, and perhaps he no longer cared. If that were true, he must have felt that he paid a high price for living too long with a single dream. I drove from the station directly to Gatsby's house, and my rushing anxiously up the front steps was the first thing that alarmed anyone. And the chauffeur said he had heard some shots, but didn't think much about them. With scarcely a word, the chauffeur, butler, gardener, and I hurried down to the pool. A cluster of leaves revolved slowly tracing a thin red circle in the water. It was after we started with Gadsby's body toward the house that the gardener saw Wilson's body a little way off in the grass, and the Holocaust was complete. The rest of that day and the next were an endless parade of police and photographers and newspaper men. Most of the newspaper reports were grotesque, circumstantial, and untrue. I called up Daisy. You can, residents. May I speak to Daisy, please? This is Nick Carraway. I'm sorry, Mr. Carraway, but Mr. and Mrs. Buchanan are not at home at present. When will they return? 
They left early this afternoon and took baggage with them. Did they say when they'd be back? How can I reach them? No, I don't know. I wanted to get somebody for Gatsby. I sent the butler to New York with a letter to Meyer Wolfsheim, which urged him to come out on the next train. The butler brought back his response. Dear Mr. Carraway, this has been one of the most terrible shocks of my life. I hardly can believe that this is true at all. Such a mad act as that man did should, should make us all think. I cannot come down now as I am tied up in some very important business and cannot get mixed up in this thing now. If there is anything I can do a little later, let me know in a letter. I hardly know where I am when I hear about a thing like this and then completely knocked down and out. Yours truly, Meyer Wolfsheim. Uh, addenda. Uh, let me know about the funeral, etc. I don't know the family at all. On the third day, a telegram signed Henry C. Getz arrived from a small town in Minnesota. It said only that the sender was leaving immediately and to postpone the funeral until he came. It was Gatsby's father. When he arrived, he was on the point of collapse. I saw it in the Chicago newspaper and headed for here right away. I didn't know how to reach you. It was a madman. He must have been mad. Wouldn't you like some coffee? I don't want anything. Where have they got Jimmy? I took him into the drawing room where his son lay. After a little while, Mr. Gatz came out. He saw the splendor of the great rooms and his grief began to be mixed with an awed pride. I told him all arrangements had been deferred until he came. I didn't know what you'd want, Mr. Gatsby. Gats is my name. Uh, Mr. Gats, I thought you might want to take the body west. Jimmy always liked it better down east. Were you a friend of my boys? We were close friends. He had a big future before him, you know. If he'd lived, he'd have been a great man. Your son was a great man, Mr. Gats. Hello, this is Mr. Carraway. This is Glenn Springer. Oh, uh, the funeral's tomorrow, 3 o'clock, uh, here at the house. I wish you'd tell anybody who'd be interested. Uh, oh, I will. Uh, of course, I'm not likely to see anybody, but if I do... Of course, you'll be there yourself. Uh, well, I'll certainly try. Uh, what I called Wait up about... Wait a minute, how about saying you'll come? Uh, well, the fact is, what I called up about was a pair of shoes I left there. I wonder if it'd be too much trouble to have the butler send them on. You see, they're tennis shoes, and I'm just sort of helpless without them. And... I hung up the telephone. I felt a certain shame for Gatsby. One gentleman I telephoned implied that he got what he deserved. The morning of the funeral, I went up to New York to see Meyer Wolfsheim. I couldn't seem to reach him any other way. He drew me into his office and offered me a cigar. When I first met Gatsby, he was a young major, just out of the army, and covered with medals. He was so hard up here that he had his, uh, he'd keep on wearing his uniform because he couldn't buy any regular clothes. First time I saw him was when he went into a Weinbrenner's pool room and asked for a job. He hadn't eaten anything for a couple of days. Come on, have some lunch with me, I said. Did you start him in business? Start him? I made him. I raised him up out of nothing, right out of the gutter. I saw right away he was a gentleman, the young man, and I knew I could use him good. You were his closest friend, so I know you'll want to come to his funeral this afternoon. Oh, I, I, I can't do it. I, I can't get mixed up in it. There's nothing to get mixed up in. It's all over now. Oh, no. When a man gets killed, I, like to get, I don't like to get mixed up in any way. Uh, let us learn to show our friendship for a man when he is alive and not when he is dead. I left his office, and when I got back to West Egg, Mr. Gatz had something to show me. Look here. This is a book he had when he was a boy. He pulled from his pocket a ragged old copy of a book called Hop Along Cassidy. On the last flyleaf was printed the word schedule, and the date, September 12th, 1906, and written underneath, 6 a.m., rise from bed. 6.15 to 6.30, exercise. 6.15 to 8.15, study electricity, etc. 8.30 to 4.30 p.m., work. 4.30 to 5, baseball and sports. 5 to 6, practice elocution, poise, and how to attain. 7 to 9, study needed adventures. 
general results, no wasting time in chapters, no more smoking or chewing, bathe every other day, read one improving book or magazine per week, save five, no, three dollars per week, be better to parents. I come across this book by accident. It just shows you, don't it? It just shows you. A little before three, the minister arrived as I began to look out the windows for other cars. Nobody else came. About five o'clock, we reached the cemetery. And as we started through the gate, I heard someone splashing after us over the soggy ground. It was the man in the owl-eyed glasses whom I had found marveling over Gatsby's books in the library just three months before. I couldn't get into the house. Neither could anybody else. Go on. Why, my God, they used to go there by the hundreds. The poor son of a bitch. After Gatsby's death, the East was haunted for me, and I decided to head back home to the Midwest. There was one thing to be done before I left. I saw Jordan Baker and talked over and around what had happened to us. When I had finished, she told me she was engaged to another man. I doubted that, but I pretended to be surprised and said goodbye. One afternoon late in October, I saw Tom Buchanan along Fifth Avenue, frowning into the windows of a jewelry store. Suddenly, he saw me and held out his hand. What's the matter, Nick? Do you object to shaking hands with me? Yes, you know what I think of you. Tom, what did you say to Wilson that afternoon? I told him the truth. He came to the door while we were getting ready to leave, and, and when I sent down word that we weren't in, he tried to force his way upstairs. He was crazy enough to kill me if I hadn't told him who owned the car. His hand was on a revolver in his pocket every minute. What if I did tell him? That fella had it coming to him. He threw dust into your eyes just like he did in Daisy's. He ran over Myrtle like you'd run over a dog and had never even stopped his car. There was nothing I could say except that it wasn't true. I couldn't forgive him. They weren't careless people, Tom and Daisy. They, they smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the messes they had made. On the last night, I went over and looked at Gadsby's huge, incoherent failure of a house once more. Then I wandered down to the beach. As the moon rose, I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes. A fresh, new world. Its vanished trees that had made way for Gadsby's house had once pandered to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory, enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, face to face with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. I thought of Gadsby's wonder. When he first picked out that green light at the end of Daisy's dock, he had come such a long way to this blue lawn that his, his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He had no idea that it was already behind him. Somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. But Gadsby believed in the green light. The orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther in one fine morning, so we beat on. Boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. of the Air presentation of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. The WBFR Playhouse of the Air is sponsored by T.J. Eckelberg Fashion Design Spectacle Frames and the Green Light Automobile Service Company. Please stay tuned for a program of popular hits from the Roaring Twenties. Good night.
director, round of applause. And you don't have to feel free to take pictures of the set or anything like that, but your family and friends will meet you all upstairs. Thank you all. Good night.